respect to the pacemaker types. I am Dr. Ullas M. Pondurangi. I am a cardiac electrophysiologist working at Madras Medical Mission Hospital in Chennai. So essentially a pacemaker is an electronic device which is capable of causing cardiac contraction by delivering electrical impulse. So in addition, a pacemaker also has the ability to sense the presence or absence of intrinsic electrical activity of the heart. The basic function of the pacemaker as the definition says it, it causes a cardiac contraction. So essentially a pacemaker is used in those where we consider the cardiac contractions per minute is less than optimal or in other words in those patients whom we think the pulse rate is lower or in whom we suspect the patient has bradycardia related symptoms. That is the clinical situation where the pacemaker is used and this device causes adequate pulse rates by causing enough number of contraction by delivering electrical impulse. So with respect to the pacemaker types, they can be typed in different varieties. They can be classified into different classes. If a pacemaker is used, for example, for a temporary purpose, in the sense, if you think the bradyarrhythmia is reversible and it is going to be lasting only for a short while, and in, in, in that situation if the pacemaker is used, then it is called temporary pacemaker. In addition to the so-called reversible causes for bradyarrhythmia, a temporary pacemaker can also be used while preparing the patient to have a long-term pacemaker on a chronic term basis and that is what we call permanent pacemaker. So with respect to whether the pacemaker is used temporarily or permanently, they can be considered as temporary pacemaker or permanent pacemaker. The most common way of typing the pacemaker or classifying the pacemaker is dependent on where the pacemaker is functioning with respect to the cardiac chambers. If the pacemaker causes or delivers an electrical impulse in only one chamber, then it would be called a single chamber pacemaker. Most often clinically a single chamber pacemaker is supposedly to be delivering the electrical impulses into the right ventricle. So that is called single chamber ventricular paced pacemaker. If the pacemaker delivers or it is capable of delivering electrical impulses in two chambers, then it would be called dual chamber pacemaker. Most commonly in the clinical practice, a dual chamber pacemaker has the capability of delivering electrical impulses in the right atrium and in the right ventricle. There are occasions where a pacemaker is used to deliver electrical impulses more than two sites in the heart and then it would be called a multi-site pacemaker. The commonest multi-site pacemaker is the one which delivers electrical impulses in the right atrium and in the right ventricle and that is a dual chamber pacemaker kinds and in addition it also has the capability of stimulating the left ventricle. So here a multi-site pacemaker, the commonest multi-site pacemaker is actually a tri-chamber pacemaker but in the clinical practice it's called multi-site pacemaker and it is also called because it is used when uh, dyssynchrony of the heart is suspected it is also called a cardiac resynchronization therapy pacemaker. So multi-site pacemaker has the capability of delivering electrical impulses at more than two sites and most often in the clinical practice it is used to pace left ventricle in addition to the right atrium and the right ventricle. There is another way of uh, typing the pacemaker or classifying the pacemaker and it is dependent on where the electrical stimulus of the pacemaker is delivered. If the electrical impulse is delivered within the chamber of the heart endocardially, 
then the pacemaker would be described as endocardial pacemaker. And that is what is the commonest of the pacemaker in the clinical patients. Occasionally, it may not be possible to deliver the electrical impulse inside the cavity of the heart endocardially. For example, when the venous access is difficult, and especially in children weighing less than about 8 to 10 kilograms, where the leads which deliver the electrical impulse may not be easily placed inside the endocardium. In such situations, the leads are placed on the surface of the heart, epicardium, and then the pacemaker will be described as epicardial pacemaker. So you have an endocardial pacemaker where the leads are placed in the cavity of the heart, and in the epicardial pacemaker, the lead is placed on the surface of the heart epicardium. There is another way also of describing the pacemaker. That is dependent on the leads which are used in that pacemaker. A pacemaker in the clinical practice uses most commonly a bipolar lead. We will discuss about the bipolar lead a little more in detail very soon. But uh, it is enough at this stage to consider a bipolar lead has an inbuilt pair of electrodes, usually one electrode which is usually the cathode is at the tip of the lead, that is the distal end of the lead and within 2 to 5 millimeter spacing away from the tip there is another electrode which acts as anode electrode. So that lead would be called bipolar. And if the pacemaker uses a bipolar lead, it would be called a bipolar lead. Unlike a unipolar lead pacemaker, where the lead has only one electrode, which is located at the distal tip and which acts like cathode. The generator, when we discuss about the components of the pacemaker, I would tell what is the generator. The generator would act like the anode. So they, the circuit is bigger, it encompasses the larger area and in bipolar lead, the electrodes because they are placed nearer to each other, the circuitry is closer. So you have a pacemaker which can be described as a unipolar lead or a bipolar lead depending on where the electrodes are placed on the lead. Recently with the advent of MRI compatible pacemakers, we can also consider typing the pacemaker as whether the pacemaker is compatible with the electromagnetic interferences which are seen in the, in the, in the labs like MRI scan lab, etc. Wherein the, the metal or the casing of the generator and the leads are made from such alloys which are resistant to magnetic forces. So if the pacemaker has the components which are resistant to the magnetic forces, then they would be described as MRI compatible pacemakers. And most of the pacemakers in the clinical practice today, unfortunately, are not resistant to the magnetic forces and they are all MRI non-compatible pacemakers. So one should be aware that if the patient has a pacemaker, it is an absolute contraindication to undergo MRI scanning. So these are the many ways by which pacemakers can be typed. Now, we will look a little more into what we mean by a temporary pacemaker. As I defined earlier, a temporary pacemaker is used when the bradyarrhythmia we consider is reversible and over a period of time the patient would come into his regular optimal rhythm or, when, or a temporary pacemaker is also used as a bridge to a permanent pacemaker. Essentially, the, the temporary pacemaker, the, the left hand side pair of devices are single chamber temporary pacemaker. That means they have a capability to stimulate only one chamber of the heart. The lead is connected to these handy generators. These have, in general, all the functionality of the permanent pacemaker generators except that these devices are bigger and the size is bigger only to make it convenient for the, the, the physician or the, uh, the surgeon who is uh, 
operating on these devices. They, they have all the capabilities. For example, you can adjust the rate, you can adjust the strength of the electrical impulse that could be delivered in terms of increasing the output which is measured in mini amperes and it also has the capacity of sensing the intrinsic activity and you can adjust the sensitivity of the lead to detect the intrinsic electrical activity. So this is a single chamber temporary phase maker generator. The lead is not shown. The lead is connected to this port which is seen here. And a dual chamber pacemaker, temporary pacemaker, also has most of the functionalities of the permanent pacemaker except that the device is larger. So this device is placed outside the body, on the bed, and then it is not actually implanted, obviously. Only the leads, either they are inserted through the venous into the cardiac chamber or it is connected to an epicardial lead. Now let us look at the components of the pacemaker, a permanent pacemaker. Compared to the, the generators which are used for the temporary pacemaker, you would notice here uh, that the generators of the permanent pacemaker are really very small. Over a period of time, since 50 years, when these pacemakers have been introduced, there has been phenomenal decrease in the size of the devices, and even with the complex devices, uh, you would, you would uh, notice that the size is little bigger than the standard matchbox, for example. Almost like one quarter the size of the mobiles what we use in day to day. So the, uh, the, the components include the generator and the leads. The generator whose size I just now described contains certain components. Most importantly, the, the, the strength or, or the current that is generated is through a battery which is stored. The battery actually provides the electrical current into the leads. So this generator houses, most importantly, the battery inside, the lithium iodide battery inside. And, and if, it all, if it is looking bigger here, the most part of it is essentially by the space that is occupied by the battery. And um, uh, over a period of time, the sizes of the battery are coming down and hence the size of the pacemaker. This, in addition, has a component which is magnified here in the right upper corner. You would notice that this generator is a dual chamber pacemaker. Why we call it dual chamber pacemaker? Because there are two leads. These two leads are connected into the socket which is seen here, and it is essential that the leads are inserted well into the socket beyond a port which has a screw. It is essential that the lead is inserted quite deep into the socket, and it is also very essential to know that the lead is snugly fixed by tightly screwing the screw which is placed here, so that there is no loose connection, and hence there are no inappropriate functioning of the pacemaker. So you have a generator which, have, which lodges the battery and most importantly the electronic circuitry and it has a place for the lead placement and with the screws. And with respect to the leads, it has the proximal end which is housed here with the generator and is fixed and a distal end. This distal end is either inside the cavity of the heart either in the right atrium or in the right ventricle. For example, this is a dual chamber. One of the leads, usually the upper lead, is connected to the right atrium and the lower lead is connected into the right ventricle, most often in the right ventricular apical region. The tip of the lead differs and it is according to the choice of the patient. If the physician thinks there is the possibility of a lead dislodgement, then he would pick up a lead which has at the distal tip a screw which can be screwed directly into the myocardium by manipulating the proximal end with some screwing equipment. So if, if you can manipulate the proximal end of the lead, the distal end opens up and then the screw comes in and then this screw gets fixed into the myocardium. And if 
the physician does not wish to use the score the so called screwing leads he may choose another lead which has got fins and these fins get trapped into the trabeculae of the myocardium and hence there occurs a firm lodgement of the lead at the distal end. Now let us look at certain other types where, uh, which is described by diagrams. See for example this generator has only one lead and now this is the generator which houses the battery electronic circuitry and there is a socket and there is one single lead. As you notice here that there is a single lead and it has gone into the right ventricular apex. So this is a single chamber pacemaker and you would also notice that the electrodes are placed, both the electrodes are placed at the distal end of this particular lead. So this would be called bipolar lead, single chamber pacemaker and it is capable of pacing one chamber and in this case is the right ventricular apical region. So here you would notice um, that um, there is a lead which is inserted through the subclavian vein and uh, it is preferred that you know the, 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 the lead is placed not necessarily in the subclavian vein but so called as by extra thoracic part of the subclavian vein that is the axillary vein to avoid the crush and other injuries and the lead is placed across the subclavian vein into the superior vena cava into the right atrium and if you want to place the lead into the ventricle it is usually across the tricuspid wall into the right ventricular apex. Now look quickly at the dual chamber pacemaker, a socket, uh, the generator, a socket which is lodging two leads, one into the right atrial appendage and one into the right ventricular apex. And as I was describing about the multi-site pacemaker, which is also called cardiac resynchronized therapy pacemaker, in addition to the functionality of the dual chamber pacemaker, where a lead is placed in the right atrial appendage and the right ventricular apex, another lead is also placed to pace the left ventricular and that lead is usually placed onto the epicardium across the coronary sinus and into one of the tributaries. So you have a single chamber pacemaker, a dual chamber pacemaker and a cardiac resynchronized therapy pacemaker as I described earlier also called multi-site pacemaker. And quickly look at what is endocardial and an epicardial pacemaker. As I described earlier, an endocardial pacemaker has a lead across the subclavian vein into the superior vena cava, either into the right atrium and or into the right ventricle or both the sides. So when the leads are placed inside the cavity of the heart, it is called endocardial or a transvenous pacemaker where the leads are lost inside the ventricle and the generator is usually placed under the skin in, in the right or the left subclavicular region, usually in the left subclavicular region. Whereas in the epicardial pacemaker, you have a lead which is placed directly onto the surface of the heart and that is usually done by exposing the heart by either sternotomy or by thoracotomy and the heart is exposed and the surgeon decides which chamber has to be paced, usually it is the left, usually the right ventricle and he places the lead onto the surface of the right ventricle and in cases of uh, dual chamber pacemaker he places a lead also onto the right atrial free wall and those two leads are connected to the generator and with respect to the epicardial pacemaker the generator is usually placed in the abdominal skin. With respect to the unipolar and the bipolar leads, I made a, a brief remark earlier. Let us look a little more into what we mean by unipolar and the bipolar lead. As I already told earlier, the commonest of the leads which are used in the pacemaker are the bipolar leads, wherein the pair of electrodes are placed in the distal end of the lead. The distal end houses the the distal end houses the cathode electrode and within 2 to 5 millimeter spacing there is another electrode 
which would behave like anode. So the circuitry is smaller. Whereas uncommonly used lead is a unipolar lead, wherein the tip houses the cathode and the generator acts as the anode. So you would notice here that the circuitry is larger. This is not commonly used because the, the circuitry encompasses the larger area and hence there can occur sensing of non-cardiac potentials and the generator might actually think there is an intrinsic electrical activity even though that activity is generated by extra cardiac sources and hence unipolar is out of the clinical scene these days. The most often the leads which are used in the clinical practice is a bipolar lead. A bipolar lead has the capacity or, or, or it can be programmed as a unipolar in case if you think one of the electrodes is damaged or a circuitry is damaged and a bipolar when a physician thinks a lead is not functioning properly and it is not wise to replace the lead, the bipolar lead in the clinical practice these days is possible to convert into unipolar lead but then it has its own disadvantages. Coming to uh, the compatible uh, pacemakers with respect to the magnetic uh, interferences which I had explained earlier. Only recently there is another company which also had come out with MRI compatible um, uh, pacemaker. Earlier there was only one company. So now we have at least two companies which have got the MRI compatible pacemakers. As I was saying, most of the pacemakers used in the clinical practice unfortunately cannot be used when, when the patient is requires uh, MRI scanning. Uh, but these MRI compatible pacemakers make the pacemaker to be resistant to the magnetic interferences. So if you have a pacemaker which is resistant to the magnetic interferences which is seen in the MRI scan, then that would be called an MRI compatible pacemaker. It is estimated uh, that in general, those patients who have requirement for the pacemakers up to 10 to 15 percent of the patients throughout their lifetime might require an MRI scanning and especially in elderly up to 30 percent of the elderly patients with pacemakers may require MRI for some diagnostic or therapeutic purposes during their lifetime. So it makes sense to choose an MRI compatible pacemaker if it is clinically indicated and if the patient is affordable. Now uh, we will talk very quickly about something known as pacemaker nomenclature and this actually describes the functionality of the pacemaker. The North Association Society of Pacing and Electrophysiology which is now called Heart Rhythm Society and British Pacing and Electrophysiology and Electrophysiology and Pacing have come out with an, a code called NB, NBG code which is universally accepted because of its ease of um, uh, clinical applicability. Essentially the NBG code consists of three or five English capital letters and each letter represents what actually uh, it is known for. For example, in the, in the common clinical scenario, if the NBG code says the pacemaker is VOO, the first letter says that the lead is used to pace ventricle. V stands for the ventricle. The first letter tells which chamber is being paced. So this NBG code consisting of three letters, the first letter which is V represents the ventricle is paced. The second letter represents what is the lead doing with respect to the sensing, whether it is sensing or no. If it is not, if it doesn't have the sensing if it doesn't have a sensing capability, then it would be called O. With respect to the sensing, what the lead or the pacemaker does, if it doesn't do anything, it is called O. So this is VOO. In the clinical practice, we, we implant the devices either in the VVI mode or in the DDD mode. What is the VVI mode? A VVI mode is a pacemaker which paces the ventricle. The pacemaker is sensing what is happening in the ventricle and its response is I standing for inhibitory in the sense if the lead 
senses that an intrinsic electrical activity, then it would not pace. So that is only the response to sensing. For example, the commonest of the dual chamber pacing modality is DDD. What does DDD mean? D means it paces dual chambers. D stands for dual chambers, both the atrium and the ventricle. And the pacemaker is sensing both the chambers, D for dual chambers. And it may either inhibit or actually trigger. Then it is called DDT. Most of the pacemakers, either in the VVI or in the DDT mode, they also come out with another capability called rate response. That means the pacemaker understands the requirement of the pacing rate. If the patient is exercising, it paces at the higher rate. So it's called rate response pacemaker. With respect to the selection of case makers, I'm not going into the detail, but quickly I would be saying that the pacemakers are most often used in three clinical situations uh, with respect to the bradycardia. One is the thick sinus syndrome, wherein you believe that the sinus node is sick and that it is not firing at an adequate rate. Then you choose typically either AAI pacemaker or a DVD pacemaker. What is AAI pacemaker? A for it paces the atrium. Another A for it senses the atrium and the I for if it senses the sinus node function, it does not pace. So that is the AAI mode. The commonest indication in the clinical practice for the pacemaker is having an AV block, which is most often higher degrees of the AV block or complete heart block, wherein you use a VVI or a DDT or a VDD as well. What is a VDD pacemaker? It paces the ventricle. However, it senses both the atrium and the ventricle. On sensing the atrium, it actually paces the ventricle after an appropriate AV delay. The other indication could be atrial fibrillation with a very slow ventricular rate, wherein you may not require to be pacing the atrium and then you may usually choose VVI, but in a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, you may actually consider using VDD. But it is essential that you choose the pacemakers which also have the functional capacity to have a rate responsive pacemaker so that the patient, even while exercising, do not have a fixed rate of pacing. He may have exercise related increase in the heart rate by the pacemaker what you have chosen. Very quickly, some other indications for the pacemakers. For example, in addition to the bradycardia, we have a syndrome called long QT syndrome where the patient may have predisposition to malignant ventricular tachycardia. For example, the long QT, you have a tendency to develop a PVC, and if the PVC occurs at a critical stage, it may develop into a malignant ventricular tachycardia. A pacemaker is used in a long QT syndrome because these patients require heavy doses of the beta blockers, and then they can occur drug-related bradyarrhythmia, and then there may be requirement for the pacemaker. Another indication is the refractory heart failure, wherein you have a cardiac dyssynchrony as represented by a wide 2 rs and if you put a multi-site pacing, you can pace the ventricle and the right ventricle, right ventricle and the left ventricle at the same time, and then you synchronize the ventricle. So another indication for a pacemaker is the refractory heart failure with wide 2 rs and the patient may be benefited with a multi-site pacing. Another indication for the pacemaker is actually for a tachyarrhythmia. We know that if the patient has a fast ventricular rate, that, and if you think that is malignant, it may be reverted with either by pacing it faster than the ventricular rate, and there you require a pacing equipment. For example, a pacemaker is used to prevent the malignant ventricular arrhythmia by using some devices called automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator. They can also be a single chamber or dual chamber. And uh, for example, here, if the patient has a ventricular tachyarrhythmia, this pacemaker, a special pacemaker called AICD, is now pacing at a faster rate than the ventricular rate. And then by pacing, a tachyarrhythmia is abolished and the patient goes into the regular sinus rhythm. What you notice here that whenever a ventricular tachyarrhythmia is terminated by either a shock or by giving 
faster rate pacing, there may occur a bradycardia. So this pacemaker not only has the capacity to, to pace at a higher rate, and when the tachycardia is terminated, and when it detects that the patient now has gone into the bradycardia, it can also function like a routine pacemaker. So a pacemaker which has the capacity to pace at a faster rate as well as a slower rate in the prevention of a ventricular tachyarrhythmia is called automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So thank you very much for being with me. Uh, so where do I go? Thank you. I rest for the last uh, few minutes because I was thinking that um, it was very didn't even see the Uh, I, I, can anybody hear me? Can uh, So, uh, Kunika, can you hear me? Okay, so, uh, there's a question here. Can you to complete? Uh, yes. So congenital to complete heart block newborn, what the pacemaker to use? So congenital to complete heart block a newborn, if you think uh, that is going to be uh, non-reversible, and um, if you are looking at a permanent pacemaker implant, uh, you should be using, number one, an epicardial pacemaker. Essentially, the heart is going to be exposed by either a sternotomy or by a thoracotomy and the lead is placed epicardially and the permanent pacemaker is housed in the abdominal cavity. So a congenital complete heart block detected in the newborn and if it is symptomatic and if there is a cardiac dysfunction it is an emergency and it should be done by epicardial approach and the generator is placed in the abdominal cavity. I have another uh, question from Dr. Kaugia. Do we put pacemaker leads in LV, that is left ventricle, anytime? Uh, we should avoid placing the lead into the left ventricle because the lead is thrombogenic and if there occurs thromboembolism, it can be disastrous because it is in the systemic circulation. So essentially, we should never put a pacemaker lead in the left ventricular cavity. There are occasions, inadvertently, the left ventricle has got the lead instead of the right ventricle. And if it is detected after a long time, then it is essential that it is removed, removed even though there is no occurrence of thromboembolism till that stage. So I think I'm clear here that never put a lead into the left ventricular cavity. Okay, so now uh, there is another way of looking at left ventricular pacing. Endocardial placement of the left ventricular lead is discouraged. One should never do. When you find, you please remove it. However, as I described earlier, in a multi-site pacing, the left ventricle is paced, I said. What I meant then was the left ventricle there is paced epicardially. For example, you can go into the cavity, into the coronary sinus, and then you come out of the cavity into the coronary sinus body, and then you can put it into the coronary sinus tributary, which is on to the surface of the heart. So that is way of pacing the left ventricle, but not endocardial. And you can always pace epicardially the left ventricle, uh, uh, left ventricle as well, but not endocardial. There is a question from Dr. Sweta who is asking me, can MRI incompatible pacemaker be used in VOO mode during MRI? It should not be. It should not be. There should be a consent from the patient that he has been told that there can occur 
life threatening injury to the myocardium and then if the radiologist also agrees then only the MRI can be performed but there should be a clear cut consent from the patient that he is willing for undergoing the uh, MRI scan in the VOO mode and in fact there are several reports where the patient with the so called incompatible pacemaker in the VOO mode even though the MRI were, uh, the, 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 the magnetic forces were away from uh, the pacemaker there have been reports of severe injury. It is, it is absolutely not advisable uh, to do this but then if it is very very uh, much required to do the MRI the consent has to be taken from the patient. So I am waiting for some more questions. I think we are all set, uh, Dr. Ulla. Thank you. That was a fabulous class. Uh, and uh, we'd love uh, to have you, you on the e session tomorrow. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and we'll also send you a copy of the recording. I'm glad to be participating. And uh, oh. thank you very much. Dr. Suresh thank Kumar encouraged me and he thought, uh, you know, I should be talking to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Suresh, so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We'll be back in touch. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye bye.